Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's uh, session uh, by NFER. So I'm uh, Jack Worth. I uh, work on the school workforce at the NFER, which is the National Foundation for Educational Research. Uh, thank you very much for coming along, uh, and thank, uh, thank you very much for all those on the live stream for joining us. We'll just give a little wave to, uh, to everybody there. Uh, please send in your questions through Twitter, I guess is the best way. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm Jack Worth, I lead our work on the school workforce, uh, looking particularly at teacher retention. Uh, and one of the issues we've come across uh, looking at teacher retention is the importance of part time and flexible working, and that's to be the, um, the topic of the discussion today. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, joined by two amazing uh, panellists uh, to, to discuss uh, the work that we've been doing, uh, in, particularly in a practitioner context, because uh, I'm, I'm a researcher, I look at the data, I, look at the, uh, I, I talk to people, but um, they, are, they are truly living it on the ground, so I'm really glad we can. Uh, have their company to, uh, to talk through uh, what this means for schools. Uh, so, uh, at the far end, we have uh, Theodora Nixon, who is the uh, co head teacher at Bishop's Hatfield Girls' School in Hertfordshire. Uh, she's uh, been uh, teaching for over, over 20 years uh, and 41 years, sorry, she's been a head teacher for, <laughs> for a long time as well. Um, and uh, the reason we, uh, uh, as, as part of the research we've been doing, we've been talking to a lot of um, head teachers uh, and we're particularly delighted to talk to uh, Theodora because uh, in her school more than half the teaching workforce uh, work part time so she really understands how to, how to make this work. Uh, and next to me is Katie Walgrave who is the director of Now Teach. Uh, she's a former history teacher uh, but uh, three years ago uh, founded Now Teach with Lucy Kellaway uh, which is an organisation that supports uh, career changes uh, to move into teaching. Good new avenue of uh, teachers of fly. So, um, I'm hoping she can tell us all about what the flexible working and part time working means for, uh, for the, those more experienced career changers who are looking to come into teaching. Uh, so, we've been doing lots of research on teacher retention and the school workforce over the last uh, five years. Uh, in looking at teacher retention, it's been uh, <coughs> uh, one of the things we found is the importance of uh, part time working to that. Uh, we found that lots of teachers who leave the secondary uh, profession, uh, secondary teaching, uh, when they move out of the teacher workforce, uh, they're working part time elsewhere, and this really <coughs> suggests that uh, they're not picking up part time roles that they might like uh, within the secondary sector. Uh, and also, we found that the secondary sector is behind the primary sector uh, in terms of uh, offering part time roles. You might expect them to be roughly, roughly the same, given. Uh, the, uh, the demand people might have, uh, but it seems that the primary sector is, uh, seems to be a bit ahead of the secondary sector in terms of um, making these opportunities available for teachers and keeping them in the profession. Um, also, uh, another piece of research we did looking at returning teachers, or potential returning teachers, uh, found that the, uh, the, the lack of part-time and flexible working was a really key barrier uh, for career, uh, career breakers, uh, those who've been on a career break maybe to look after children uh, and uh, wanted to make a return but finding it really challenging to, to return uh, because of this issue. So this is why uh, it's so important and it's also important in the secondary sector because there's a really big teacher supply challenge on at the moment. The number of pupils is increasing rapidly in the next five or ten years uh, and the uh, recruitment targets uh, are not being uh, sufficiently met, especially in some key subjects. So it's really important that we retain as many teachers as possible to meet that supply challenge. Uh, so we've just done a new piece of research uh, looking at, uh, that, that's kind of national background, uh, but then we really wanted to dig into this and uh, talk to some schools about how, how the most flexible schools make things work, uh, and to understand a little bit more about how all schools experience the, benefit, the challenges, uh, but also the benefits uh, of part-time and flexible working. Uh, so we did a, a survey uh, of teachers to find out about uh, who, who would like to um, who currently works full time and might like to work part time, and the reasons why that hasn't uh, come to bear. Uh, and then we spoke to a number of uh, head teachers about how it, how it works in those schools, both those uh, who have very high levels of part time working, like uh, Theodora School, uh, but also those with, um, so with with kind of part time rates around the average or slightly below the average, to really find out what what their approach is and why how it might be different to those most flexible schools. <coughs> So in terms of the barriers uh, and the challenges, um, the uh, ensuring continuity for pupils came up as a really, a really big one. Thinking about pupil outcomes 
first and foremost, uh, and then balancing that against the needs of um, the staff. Uh, and in secondary schools, this is particularly complicated because of the issue of timetabling. Uh, so making sure that all of these things fit together in the timetable uh, was, is a challenge uh, for, for all schools. Uh, another challenge was ensuring communication. If you've got um, some staff working part-time, they may not be on site all of the time. Uh, and making sure communication happens between, uh, between staff who are handing over or just between pupils and staff, between uh, different staff, uh, is another challenge. Uh, one, uh, another one of the challenges was uh, to do with cost. Uh, so having to employ uh, part-time teachers can mean that you, uh, that you need uh, overlap time to, to ensure that communication happens uh, and that can be uh, more expensive than uh, like for like employing a full-time teacher. Uh, however, there are really important benefits that, uh, that you can uh, reap uh, by part-time flexible working. It's not just all challenges. Um, there, as, as we've mentioned, it has really important effects on retention, so retaining teachers who would otherwise leave, ensuring they stay in the profession, uh, and trying to ret uh, retain them uh, permanently, because if, if the, uh, the need for part-time work may be a relatively temporary thing, uh, and we wouldn't want to risk uh, losing people permanently from the profession Uh, also, it has uh, important benefits for just teacher well-being, uh, and also it can have quite an um, important uh, role for filling in gaps within uh, curriculum, within the timetable, uh, for roles that don't necessarily need a full-time uh, staff member. So you can ask um, a, a teacher to do a particular role uh, while not expecting them then to also fill in the, the other bits of the timetable that needs filling in, which maybe isn't their expertise. Um, the key difference that we found between these most flexible schools and the less flexible schools that we were speaking to, a lot of them raised a lot of these challenges, a lot of the benefits, recognised some of these benefits as well. Um, but one of the, but the key difference between them was the proactive leadership in those schools. So going out uh, and having conversations with staff about what their needs are, have, uh, encouraging honesty from, uh, from, from staff so you know what you're dealing with, uh, and then you can take that um, that information and you can feed it into the timetabling process in good time so uh, so t you're trying to meet the needs uh, as the school leader you're trying to meet the needs of the teachers uh, while also uh, balancing against those pupil needs and what the curriculum is which also drives the timetable um, <clears throat> uh, and also those, co those conversations um, can identify uh, teachers who would like to work part-time, would like to work, uh, have some flexibility, uh, but that you wouldn't know about otherwise. So when we surveyed teachers, one of the key barriers they said was coming up, the, the key reason why they were currently working full-time, uh, but they weren't working, uh, part, but they would like to work part-time, um, was the perception that their request would not be uh, listened to by, uh, by senior leadership. So having those conversations really enables you to, uh, to open that up. Uh, and uh, yeah, and um, and being uh, proactive about pairing people up, so you've got you can, you can ensure the good communication, so that is built into the timetable process as well. Uh, so I think that gives a, a good overall summary of, of the uh, research. Uh, I'm looking forward to um, digging into it in a bit more uh, detail. Uh, there's also the uh, report uh, printed out at the back, which I think Sunny has been uh, kindly putting into people's hands as well. So please take it away. Please read it. Um, but uh, at this point, I'd like to um, to bring in our panel to, to talk about the, uh, the implications a bit further. So, um, could I ask uh, Theodora to uh, tell us some more? Hello, everyone. Um, what I will say before I get started is that the degree of flexibility in any school very much depends on the context of that school, uh, and I, I think that's absolutely critical um, to to get to know your school. You, you only know. The degree to which you can introduce flexible working if you know your school and particularly your staff really well. Those people skills are something that actually doesn't get taught as part of MPQH or anything like that, but you have to have them if you're going to make anything like this work. I'll give you a little bit of context about mine. We're a single sex, uh, five form entry girls' school in Hertfordshire, bordering London, which makes recruitment and retention a critical issue because while we have fringe, we're five miles away from an inner London allowance which is actually a, a real problem when you know, we're sorting out pay, etc. It doesn't um, bode well when somebody says, well, I can like, I've been offered a job five miles down the road and I'm going to be earning 8,000 pounds more than what you're offering me. But we're actually quite hard line. If you want to come to work with us, that's the salary we're not negotiating. 
Um, so we've got 900 students, and our sixth form is only feasible. We've got about 175 at the moment in the sixth form. It's only feasible because we've got consortium arrangements, which brings in flexible working as well, because we have shared timetables, and we do shared teaching across sites as well, with staff moving. So we've introduced quite a, a level of flexibility there. And the flexible working is modelled from the top. I work two and a half days a week with my co-head, who covers the school for the other two and a half days. It's part of my retirement plan. I'm on my way out. I should, we should have gone ages ago. Um, but on my way out. But it's been really good for succession planning because we've been able to step up different people into acting roles, associate assistant heads, associate deputy headship roles, all of that degree of flexibility to broaden people's own experience and skills and make sure things carry on as normal. You've got to get the governing body on your side. I think that's the other critical thing. They've got to understand why you want to do what you want to do, but the benefits are there. <coughs> Two key policies that I think you need in a school if you're going to make this work, and one is a flexible working policy, um, which we do have. It clarifies all the issues and it clarifies timelines, saying that if you want to change a contract, you've got to let us know by X date, etc. So actually, being explicit, everybody knows the facts, and I think that's really important. And as long as staff are aware, because it's detailed in the policy, what they can and what they can't have, then it makes the discussions easier. So they can come and say, well, you know, I've actually, I'm on four days a week, I've actually dropped to three days a week, I actually need a later start on Monday mornings because I've got to get my mother to her carer or whatever. Various things like that. It, it enables those discussions to take place if things are clearly laid out in a policy. Leave of absence policy is the other one that I think is critical. So for example, you know, member of staff needs a day off for a sick child. Our leave of absence policy says, yes, you have one day. It gives you time to make arrangements or whatever. I've worked in schools previously. If you don't have something like that really explicit, they'll throw a sick in themselves because they don't know what else to do, which then just encourages deceit. Um, and what we want to do is to promote honesty. Um, and we also make unpaid leave available for special occasions. We work in this ridiculous profession where we don't have the annual leave that so many other professions have. People have got to work within their times, but people are getting married abroad, people are having 50th birthday celebrations up and down the country, and they expect family members to attend, and they forget that some family members are limited by school holidays. So, you know, the, we do say you can leave five days because you've got to go to Bermuda, them. It's unpaid um, because obviously we've got to provide the supply and cover, and it's not always guaranteed. We usually negotiate if people need something like that. But I think again, that brings the staff on your side. So when you then go and ask them to do something, they're more likely to say yes because they know that you've been agreeable to them. So from September, I have 63 teaching staff as bodies. It equals 50 full-time equivalent. 31 of those 63 are part-time, so it's, it's literally on that 50%. And the range is from 0.17 for somebody who comes in an hour and a half a week to teach a specialist A-level area, to 0.93 because they want an afternoon off, um, literally to go and check that their parents are okay. The average of all the part-timers is 0.6. That tends to be, but I will never guarantee they get that on three days. If I say it's got to be five mornings, it's got to be five mornings. If, if they want that part-time, we'll do everything we can to accommodate it, but they can't expect Mondays off, or Fridays off, or three days in a row. I think you have to run those negotiation skills. That's why I said the people skills are really, really important. Of over 40 support staff, only three are full-time. So again, we've got that flexibility across everywhere. Proportionately, um, from you know, the number of men I employ to the number of female I employ, proportionally, it's equal numbers asking for part-time. And again, sometimes it could be a medical reason, because they need to see a physiotherapist regularly, or whatever. So the flexibilities we offer, um, as well as the part-time, include late starts and early finishes to accommodate childcare. Some, and it's, this one does tend to be women, will often say, I, I really need to be at that school gate on at least two afternoons a week just to catch the primary school teacher. The 
they're asking for a last lesson on you know, two afternoons a week, we will try and accommodate that. Or sometimes it's first, first thing in the morning. And maybe each day is pretty different on that. We enable PPA to be done at home. Um, because as long as the work is done, and if it's PPA time, why should I stick them in an office where they could get distracted, etc.? As long as the work is done, I don't mind where they do it. I have one member of staff who needs to leave for an hour and a half in the middle of the day to walk a dog. Um, fair enough, if she's not teaching, why am I keeping her in school at that particular time? Again, that's how she uses her PPA time, as long as the work is done, fair enough. Our inset days and our meeting attendance to proportionate to people's contracted hours. So if they're on a 0.5 timetable, I only expect them to come in for 0.5. And that is all negotiated with the Richard on the first day of term in September um, when they can see what the planned activities are for inset and meetings. And they choose which ones they want to attend. And then they, they, they obviously sort of subscribe to those. If parents' evening falls on a day when staff are not working, obviously attendance is voluntary. That's, in, that's, that's, that's a sort of teach to pay conditions. They don't have to come in for something like that. But actually, most do. I've only got one. Um, who basically says I'm not going to do that. We offer toil, carefully locked. So if somebody is working non-contracted hours, and this often affects practical subjects, if I've got a part-time PE teacher and they've got a moderator and they don't come in on a certain day, and it's a day when they don't normally work, they have to be there because there's a PE or an art or a drama moderation, they will get that time off in lieu. Um, so as long as it's locked, they've come in X number of hours, they'll get that time off in lieu. We've created hybrid roles in our support staff. So our learning support assistants aren't just learning support assistants, they're cover supervisors as well. So they spend a third of their week doing cover supervision, two thirds doing learning support. So that if cover is required for absent colleagues, it's usually somebody internal and they're known to people as well, known particularly known to the students, really, really important. We accept heads of faculty into part-time roles. Um, but say it's got to be at a minimum of 0.8. Um, if you can't do full time, you just want to do something, you could be four days a week, fine, you can still uh, be a, a head of faculty. Or we job share. I've had a job share head of maths for the last three years, and that's actually worked out very well, again, because both wanted to work part time. We advertise all our posts as part or full time. Um, I'd rather have two part-time excellent teachers than one full-time satisfactory teacher. But again, it's, it's a mindset of knowing how, how you get that to match. Um, we use TLR3s quite a lot when we need specific projects to be done. And they're very useful, particularly for part-time staff who want to sort of prove that they can offer something to the school but can't fulfill a full TLR role. The issues we face in doing all of that Split classes, it does happen because it's timetable driven. And split form tutoring, mm -hmm. except what we've done is, with a lot of our part-time staff, they're sixth form tutors, so we don't have sixth form form period anymore. They're assigned a personal tutor, and they can, as long as they meet with them for 10 minutes a week, or in small groups, they can meet them whenever they want by adopting that system rather than visits forming groups. Meeting with colleagues is an issue. If you're only in two days a week and the person you need to meet to discuss something with gets an issue, we have to find a way to work around it. And fragmented faculties. So for example, my English faculty has nine staff, only two of whom are full-time. And that's, that's an issue in itself, and actually getting the meetings all together. So we do rely on electronic digital communication quite a lot. In terms of the timetable, I, you know, we offer our timetable at every support available. And I have frequently had to say to her, go work from home. I don't want to see you for the next two days. Go and work from home until you've sorted out that particular problem. You can't do it while you're in school because she's trying to juggle all of this. Your timetable needs excellent negotiating skills with staff. Um, as a timetabler myself, I know you're either the most popular or the least popular member of staff at the timetable, at the time the timetable is being written. Um, but you've got to put the needs of the students first. We send out requests um, to be filled in over the Christmas holidays. So it goes out in December, and we say January. We send a request out to all staff, if you want any changes to your contract, let us know by January, please. If 
you're thinking that you want to increase your hours, decrease your hours, etc., please let us know and give us the reasons why. Um, but we won't guarantee anything. I think that's that's also in flexible working policy. You can ask, but we can't make any promises until we've really tidied up the timetable and we know what the staffing is like. So, you know, to sum it up, it's really important that you know your staff, I think. Uh, you value them by trying to accommodate their needs. At least listen. If you can't do it, you can't do it, but at least you listen. I know heads who say, don't even bother asking me, because it's not going to happen. And that, that can only alienate people. Um, last year I had nine maternities. All but two have returned to part-time work. Um, so this summer I have one leaver. Um, a 70-year-old who's finally retiring. <laughs> um, I waited May the 31st with trepidation. I know everybody in school does. I have no other designation, so I find myself fully staffed, and I've got to knock on some wood somewhere, because I know it's a rarity. I'm fully staffed for September, which is wonderful, but with lots of part-time, obviously, but it's a really good set of teachers. I've got an ageing workforce, we've got very low turnover, over 50% of my workforce are age 45 plus, quite a few into their late 50s, some of us into our 60s, but it's a low turnover, and I don't think you can be that experience if context of the school. It's, it's very much individualised. There isn't a one-size-fits-all. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was, a, that was a real insight into what this looks like on the ground. Uh, it sounds like uh, so it's working in your school. It, well, it, yes, but it might not work at the school across the ground. Yeah, absolutely. You need a HR director. <laughs> 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 you can see for HR director. <laughs> <laughs> I do have somebody who's in, within the admin team, their role is HR, just keeping on top of things. Yeah. So do you do five mornings or do you do two and a half days? And does that, is that subject to negotiation? Well, when I said to the Borussia, I said, I'll do Monday, Tuesday, and what about half day Friday? And they went, you're skipping off Friday afternoon. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll do Friday afternoons, okay? And I won't, I'll do Friday afternoons, but I won't do Monday mornings. So I, I literally go in uh, halfway through the day on Monday, all day Tuesday, half day Friday. Do you overlap with the...? Uh, he's full-time anyway. Oh, right. So, you know, I can catch hold of it. He's worked his way up from being head of humanities to assistant head to deputy head and now co-head. And he will take over as head teacher when I go at the end of next year. So it's actually worked out really well. Would you have worked if you both been part um, I, I do know of schools who have used that approach. It works if there's overlap. Yeah. And the people are very comfortable to pick up the phone to each other yeah. and don't mind taking a phone call on the day when they're not supposed to be working. Yeah, yes, I check my emails on the days when I'm not working, but, but I'm actually providing two days of childcare to my daughter who's a primary school teacher who's also <laughs> gone part-time. <laughs> so. Great. Uh, <laughs> well, lots to digest there. Um, so, Katie. In terms of people coming into the profession, so uh, could you tell us a bit about part-time flexible working in your career change? Definitely. So um, basically, I want to clone you. Please, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be I want to talk to you about working in the future. But anyway, that's separate. So um, well, I don't think now teach, and that is getting in career changes uh, into into the profession. So so recruiting, supporting through that minefield of recruitment in the beginning. Uh, place them in a school and then support them to kind of wrap around these who partner with different training providers and the aim is to retain them because statistically speaking not only do not many older people go into teaching if they do they drop out at exponentially higher rates than, than their younger colleagues so um, our job really I think is finding people and helping keeping them uh, our sort of age range so far is 42 to 72 I think the average is about 55 so this is probably kind of second careers it's not people who sort of had to go at something else for a year or two and then change their mind. Um, and the reason we exist is sort of obvious one, there's a horrific crisis that we just need to target a demographic that's not being targeted. Even if we weren't, I think that what you can bring, what you bring with geographic <coughs> speech, but also success from other sectors, could be really exciting for the education profession. It tends to be quite a kind of closed shop for people who sort of been in it most of their lives. Um, uh, and of course, uh, so I started this with a journalist, Kind of a few years ago, 
years ago, and I, I just had twins, and we were both holding these tiny little babies and looking at them and thinking, we both read the same book called The 100 Year Life by Andrew Scott, I don't know if you come across it, and then the Grattan. And statistically, we learned that one thing that this book um, stuck out mostly for me was that these two tiny babies were more likely, both of them, to live to 100 than both of them not to live to 100. And he said, well, this is going to change our working patterns and our, our you know, so much, so drastically. It won't be logical that we all just carry on doing the same thing forever. And that's kind of why we exist and what we found. But of course, for people coming into the profession from other sectors, um, there's a huge demand and desire for, for flexible work. Not from everybody, but for quite a lot. And I think the, the difference between flexible and part-time also is, is significant for them. I think all of them, it, expect and want and assume they will find more flexibility than they tend to find. So they are astonished by the idea of a school that have direct time where you're supposed to be there until six. And they're always amazed to me how many there still are of school, you know, you're supposed to be there until six. So, you know, whatever is going on in your life, you must be you must be there. And that seems entirely illogical to people who've become pretty autonomous in their own working lives and I think out of out of sort of kilter with most other professions. Um, I suppose also specifically with ITT, we've worked with our training partners to compress the training. So it isn't part time, they still do their initial teacher training in one year, but they have a day where they don't have to be anywhere, not timetable, and they don't have to be somewhere. And again, it's just that degree of autonomy. Some of them choose to spend time in school, that's fine, but it is an attractive sort of incentive to, to start a slightly, slightly more, more say, of your life. So I think. There is flexibility and then there is part time. In terms of sort of why they want it, I think I know we would recruit many, many more people if, if sort of generally it was known that the teaching profession would like this as opposed to the way it is. Because it may not be that when they start at whatever 55 they want part time, but they're pretty confident that there might come a time when they will, either just because they get to a stage where they well, you know, you don't have to work five days, why not work? if you could make it work, um, that would be good. But also because, and I think when I trained to teach age 22, I was basically responsible for no one, and a lot of that class, you know, they're responsible for children, grandchildren perhaps, um, partners who get sick, parents who get sick, that, you know, there's a lot, and they, they're very aware of that. And you don't want to start off on something which even if it suits you for the next couple of years, you're probably not gonna be able to manage it for all ways. So, um, I mean, it is that that thing we're all going to want. Most people don't want flex part time all of their lives. But most of us are going to want it at some point for whatever for whatever reason. And I always feel like it's a kind of delayed problem for most sort of entry into teaching. Certainly, when I was starting, I didn't think about it. I would definitely think about it. Now I would think, well, if I was still teaching, um, but it's a sort of immediate one for us, which is why it's a kind of real it's a kind of campaign goals and like NFBI would just have had to produce a report with many of the same conclusions but the, around around the barriers that, that people find. Um, and the one that I think is interesting, I'd love to know more about this from you, is that I think that if the will is there, timetables, difficult as they are, we also work with the SMP, can be solved if, if the will is there. Likewise, you know, you can make split classes work and where it works, actually it can be really great to have a more of a subject specialist on different topics and all of that. Um, you can make the rational economic argument that okay, there might need to be a little bit of overlap and that's expensive, but on the other hand, if you then keep those people for five years, you know, well that's got to be better than, than recruiting more of them. Where I get stuck in arguing with head teachers, which I do, is because we place most people in quite challenged context schools, they say, but my kids need continuity. My kids don't necessarily have that at home. They need the continuity, and I am anxious about the um, about the impact on student results. And I never quite know which way around that argument's coming. Is it actually that that kind of does stop me? I can't argue very effectively with it, but actually it comes more from the sort of vague feeling, or is that, you know, the trouble is there isn't a lot of research, and we were talking yesterday about how difficult it would be to produce really solid research to show that, that actually it doesn't impact on students. But I do think there must be something about that continuity. You know, there was a question you asked about where, where's the need for further research, I think it's really hard to do, but it would be fascinating if we could find compelling arguments to say, not just economic speaking, and not just because you've got to, because otherwise you're never going to find a physical teacher, but actually there could be something quite good about this. Um, yeah, I think the profession is changing. I would, I would, I would
just wonder what Do, do we have any questions from the from our from our audience? Yes, um, yes um, Flexible working policy. Um, what do you say about days? Like, make no promises. Mm -hmm. I, I have a, a teacher that that tells me she's just going to leave if it can't be Fridays, and I'm really struggling. This is the fourth year she's had Fridays, and the credibility for others that I, I try and be fair, and she's holding the school to ransom by, I have to be off on Fridays. Set them free. Um, <laughs> I, 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 like your, I, I really like a copy of the flexible working policy, because it, it, at my timetable, I have been part-time, I am now full-time, and I timetable, and, and I just, I'm desperate to treat everybody the same it, with fairness on the timetable, but it's very, very difficult within subjects, because if they're taught in secondary in a big block, yeah. Those blocks, woo -hoo, they are really hard to move. Shift one and the whole thing goes Yeah, up. and you won't get, you, you won't get a timetable. So, and other subjects, it's like, oh yeah, I can do that. And, and then, oh, you've got to have a different conversation with a different person, but hang on, you've got to treat them the same. And, and, and treat them in the, in the same way, fairly, as you keep your full-time and part-time staff, you shouldn't be, and then, Certain full time staff end up with hellish Friday afternoons. Yeah. And we always say, look, you know, okay, you want to do four days? I cannot. If you'd like Friday, if we can make it work, we'll make it work. If we can't, it might have to be another day. You now decide whether you want the other day or whether you want to move on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you then guarantee them a day if they said, oh, I only want to walk back four yeah. days? Yeah. Do you guarantee them a day? Yeah, yeah they're on point eight. That's what I'm that's not getting. Yeah, we so I'm on point six five and the school I work in a boarding school and I work six days a week. And I'm on point six five. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's about, you know, if you've, if you've had to do a compromise on the number of staff, you're not giving them the day they want, you try to accommodate them. So, and, and quite often I'll sort of say, well, is there something else you'd be prepared to teach? Would you plug a gap somewhere if we needed you to? I mean, it's rare that that has to happen, because actually the clever advantage of part-timers is you can plug those gaps sometimes. It can actually work to your advantage if they are flexible about when more work. So what we encourage in the teachers that we've seen is that well, about 60%, and certainly pretty much everyone who wants to be part-time, of our Typical, so we're early days, but are part time. And I think it's been quite interesting. I mean, one is that we've been kind of giving them good guidance, which is essentially that do not insist, do not expect from quite a lot of them. They're all sorts of different. Yeah, flat mouth ahead, that doesn't sound good. Um, and lots of different arrangements where the people are working 60% across five days, because actually that does suit them to be home every afternoon or, or, or to be never to demand a day and to sort of come at it from an intelligent solutions based approach. Yeah, but, could work, I've been thinking about it. Um, but I think there is also something, you you were saying that you know, quite often people don't ask because they yeah. assume no, and our lot, I think, probably because they're a bit more confident, possibly because they've seen it work in other sectors, do ask, and have been tending to get. I mean, I also think it's possibly a bit of they would, they could probably take the risk of walking, they could get what they want. Am I right in thinking as well that I've worked in as part-time in a state school and yeah. in a yeah. independent school, and my experience definitely just been that the state school bent over backwards mm. yeah. much more than the independent mm. school in terms of locking me brilliantly. So I spent I spent 17 years that. working week four and two days a week, which was extraordinary, I guess. Whereas I found moving into the independent school, I mean, obviously different advantages, but much 
you know, much more spread and much more reluctance to try and consciously sort of learn pattern, yeah, that's which I, I think is what you're experiencing because you've got to do the Saturdays. Well, that's what I was going to ask was, is this research just state sector or is it independent? It's just state well, sector, yeah. Have so, you got any of the state boarding schools in there? Uh, I don't think so, no. Some no. differences, I, I worked in the independent sector mm. and I was part time in the state sector. And in the independent sector, the, the option books aren't fixed. Every year I spend time in November working out who would like to do which subject at A level, what they might swap to. And one year I have two A level biology classes, the next year I've got five. Yeah. So well, I'm, 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 and the head says, whatever you do, Sarah, get all the pupils their choice of subject. Yeah. And I've done it for the last three years, and they've all got well, they've chosen. But then you've got to balance that with, with what your part time mm. staff would like yeah. to do. And, See, and who's teaching what? So it's my the one thing you're juggling act. Going part time, which I think is probably, like you say, come up with a lot, is I've got I'm now two and a half year old. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I've asked for. This, I asked for this academic year and was told no, and I've asked for the next academic year and I've yet to find out if the timetable works is to have Saturday mornings off because I can't find childcare on a Saturday because it doesn't exist. Um, my, my husband works in the leisure industry, he runs a climbing centre, and so obviously Saturday mornings are really, really busy for him. So it's been a real juggle this year trying to find childcare on a Saturday and I've really struggled with it. Next year. Um, and I guess the fact that the, the state sector has such a huge range. And well, if you're a bigger school, the bigger school has a more scope because they're all classes yeah. to teach. But I think there is also, certainly I found the block of the, 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 the sort of, and I worry that they'll end up losing out, that the schools that are need, have the greatest need essentially for great teachers are sometimes the ones that are the, the most resistant to the idea. They're most worried and anxious about their students. They're also sort of in some strange way, but they're also right at the edge on the budgeting questions. So yeah, I don't know though because I think increasingly staff and other staff, you know, I think there's a feeling more in the state sector to accommodate you because if you're an experienced teacher of maths or English, you are a fairly important commodity. <laughs> and if you've delivered over the years, they will keep you. So they will keep you sweet. Whereas I think in public schools perhaps as well as having the Saturdays, uh, there's a sort of feeling, oh, well, we can replace you. And if you don't, if you don't want to do it in the way that we want you to do it, well, we'll find something wrong. It's interesting what you're saying about the, you know, the, the, your time age group, because the other thing I'm finding is, as people are starting to approach retirement, they will say to me, do I want to scale down now? Mm -hmm. To start getting ready, so they'll get to 55. And I could have a head of department who's 55, so I says, can I just go back to classroom mm -hmm. teaching? And then the following year they say, I'll do three days a week, let's bring somebody else on, etc. Um, so I'm finding that happening again. I don't want to lose their expertise because, because they can make such a valuable contribution and they can coach other people as well. So again, it's, it's accommodating some of the schools would then just lose that and you've lost all that experience. Yeah, and nationally the number of teachers in their 50s is going down, yeah. massive leaving rates, and the retirement rate, the, the kind of normal age retirement rate dropped off a cliff because. It's, uh, yeah, you're not getting that kind of ease towards retirement. We've got all the goldies and goldies and goldies. And there's a new teacher coming into the profession. You want to learn from yeah. it, yeah. Um, I a question. Do you, do you say, that so if somebody gets into the routine of, I don't know, they don't work Thursdays or something, one year, do you say the following year that will be the same or every year is a week? Depends what they, what they feed back to us in the January after they've had a think over Christmas, you know, are they going to be more flexible about their days, have they got a good Friday? There, there are cases where, and I've got one member of staff who has to take her ageing mother to a specific clinic every Wednesday, and that's why she wants that day so that she can do that. Now, obviously something like that we will bend over backwards yeah. to accommodate. Mm -hmm. Because we've had that a bit where it's sort of knocking into other people's lives. So somebody who's offered their Wednesday to their daughter to do childcare, therefore that will <coughs> set up their life around that. And and the other them. thing we make clear is don't then demand that you teach that A-level class or that GCSE mm -hmm. class. Yeah, pick what you want to buy for. It doesn't <laughs> fit, it doesn't fit. Yeah. I'd like to uh, pick Theodora up on uh, something interesting you said as well, because one of the things we've been thinking about at NPR 
is, um, is what the government can do about this. So the Department for Education published its recruitment and retention strategy in January. Uh, they're very interested in this question, but they recognise in that document that it's so important is what happens on the ground, how the head teacher approaches that. Uh, and you said um, sort of that, so that softer skills of people management doesn't come through NPQH. So how does how does a head teacher, a new head teacher or an experienced head teacher, develop those skills? What should we do? What should we do about uh, sort of spreading really, best practice in this area? That's a really good question, and some may never develop those skills. But I, I, I do think, and I know it's done differently in different areas. Um, professional partnering with an experienced teacher who's got lots of experience of, of, of that, that kind of issue, I think is actually really, really important. Um, don't leave them alone. Um, make sure they have a buddy to go and talk to when these things happen. Somebody who's got enough experience who's faced all of this themselves. And we, we're lucky in Hertfordshire that we we brought out the local authority, as for want of a bit. Don't, please don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, you could see what the writing on the wall was for local authorities, and we didn't want to lose a lot of what the local authority did for us. So we created Hearts for Learning, um, which is a, a, a private limited company that all the schools are shareholders in. And in doing that, we determine what we want from them. So advisory staff, um, brokering of uh, appraisal for head teachers. Um, taking care of schools that might be struggling, pairing them up with a head from another school, etc. So we've got that facility in place, which is really, really good to sort of try and prevent the crises occurring. Um, but the, the buddying, the, the school to school support, and encouraging schools to do that kind of school to school support, I think is critical. There, there isn't a course in people's skills. There probably are, but doesn't mean it's, it's the old adage about you can teach something that doesn't mean everybody learns it. Um, yeah, I think you, you learn from example. You need you learn by watching other people how they do things. And I don't think you can underestimate that skill schools. Good advice to end on. Uh, <laughs> uh, please join me in thank you very much to the uh, panel. Thank you very much all for coming. Uh, please do grab a copy of the report at the back of the room. Uh, and uh, have a nice rest of the day.